Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers webinar on the benefits of group prenatal care. My name is Andrea Palmer, and I am a program manager at the Prisca Children's Initiative, which funds the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers. Next slide, Chloe. We have a jam-packed agenda today. I will briefly discuss the Pritzker Children's Initiative, our outcomes framework, and the findings of the Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns Evaluation. I will introduce our guest speakers who will discuss the Centering Health Institute and New York's First 1,000 Days Project. Next slide, Chloe. And the next. The Pritzker Children's Initiative has a vision that every child will enter kindergarten ready to learn. To actualize that vision, we have a big, hairy, audacious goal, or what we lovingly refer to as a BHAG, that by 2023, one million more vulnerable infants and toddlers and their families will have access to high quality services and supports in the prenatal to age three space. Next slide. Our prenatal to three outcomes framework provides the guideposts by which we are measuring our work toward achieving our BHAG. Group prenatal care fall squarely within the category openings. Next slide. From 2013 to 2017, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services conducted the Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns evaluation. The evaluation looked at the outcomes of three prenatal strategies being implemented within 27 communities across the country to determine the strategy's impact on the quality of care, reduction in preterm and low birth weight infants, and reduction in the cost to Medicaid during pregnancy and in the infant's first year. Group prenatal care was one of the models evaluated in that study. The outcomes of 10,508 participants across 60 sites were evaluated, and it was determined that Medicaid participants and group prenatal care had better outcomes at lower costs relative to other Medicaid participants with similar, similar characteristics. Next slide. Today we are shining a light on centering pregnancy, which is really the gold standard for group prenatal care. Um, this, on the slide, you will see an overview of the webinar as well as the learning objectives, which are to describe the centering con continuity model, um, outline state and national policy initiatives, relate centering practices to state interventions and community initiatives, and um, learn how the model is effectively facilitated at the local and state level. Next slide. Marina Barnett, Burnett and Angie Truesdale from the Centering Health Institute will discuss how centering improves health outcomes and supports healthy ch parent-child interactions, early learning, and positive parenting within the frame framework of billable group health care visits. Marina Burnett is the Chief Engagement Officer at Centering Health in Institute. She leads the development of centering products, services, and training, and guides the market and communication initiatives. Her, fo her focus is to create awareness of and equitable access to centering group care across the life course. Marina joined Centering Health Institute in 2015, bringing together her extensive experience working in a large integrative medical practice and developing scaling and innovat innovative parenting health education program. Angie Chusdale joined Centering Health Institute as Chief Executive Officer in 2015 bringing leadership from the nonprofit, government relations, and advocacy roles to the organization. In just under five years, Angie has positioned Centering as a scalable healthcare delivery model for mothers, babies, and families throughout the nation. She has led Centering Health Institute's focus on quality assurance for Centering sites and practitioners, invested greatly in the Centering Parenting 0-2 to two pediatric model, and worked with immensely talented Centering Health Institute team to expand access to centering in more than 600 clinical locations across 47 states, nine of which have payment innovations to incentivize centering. Following Marina and Angie, Melody Baker from the United Way of Buffalo in Erie County, New York, will talk about her state's implementation of the comprehensive First 1000 Days project, which included the Centering Pregnancy Strategy. Following Melody's presentation, we will end with a Q&A with our presenters. So please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box throughout the webinar. Without further ado, I present Marina Burnett.
Thanks to Andrea for this gracious introduction uh, to the NCI team for hosting and for all of the participants for joining in today. I especially appreciated seeing all of the thoughtful questions that were submitted and our hope is that over this next hour that we will address those questions for you. So I'm Marina Burnett with the Centering Healthcare Institute. And bear with me. Okay. So what is centering? It's a healthcare visit in a comfortable group setting. Centering brings patients out of the exam room and into a group setting where they learn from their providers and each other. Centering was started more than 25 years ago by a nurse midwife who was seeking a better way to deliver care and a way to address her own frustrations and burnout. Centering pregnancy is our flagship model, bringing eight to 12 patients and partners caregivers or support people together for prenatal care. And Centering Parenting evolved organically as parents were welcoming their babies and insisting that they could stay together for care for their children in their groups. The continuity model, we refer to as the P to two model, is where we believe uh, Centering can have the greatest impact. I want to note that centering is the billable healthcare visit. It's not an additional program or extra class. Reimbursement from Medicaid and other insurance effectively subsidizes centering for healthcare practices. In each two hour visit, centering integrates three components of care that work together to impact patient health behaviors. And it's how these elements the health assessment, interactive learning, and community building are woven together. That is the magic of centering. So in centering pregnancy, patients take an active role in their own health assessment by uh, tracking their BMI, and they're taught to take their own blood pressure. In centering parenting, Baby's weight, length, and head circumference are, are measured and their growth and immunizations, development, and oral health are tracked by the patient, by the parent or caregiver. And so why is this important? Patients are learning more about their health and the importance of self-care and wellness and are collaborative partners with their healthcare team when they're involved in their own self-assessments. Each visit include, includes the traditional one-to-one -one prenatal or pediatric health assessment, screenings, exams, tests, immunizations, and oral health. Clinical care follows nationally recognized guidelines, such as the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, for prenatal care and the American Academy of Pediatrics to Bright Futures for Pediatric Care. The so clinical assessments take place in a private space within the centering room, which helps to normalize the experience for everyone. Learning in a group visit is a much different experience than the didactic approach found in traditional primary care, where patients, for the parents, our passive listeners and health professionals can only guess what information is actually being absorbed or accepted. Centering is based on the principles of adult learning, which demonstrate that when someone is actively involved and engaged, they learn and retain information more than when they are lectured to or read something. Centering facilitators encourage participants to raise issues and explore solutions themselves, resulting in better learning and understanding. In each two-hour visit, there is an ability to layer interventions, such as behavioral health, developmental specialists, oral health, nutrition, 
breastfeeding support and to bring in community resources, whether it be a local food bank or Zumba instructors, um, and to also include other national offerings such as Reach Out and Read. This format enables a warm handoff for further care and creates a connection to these other resources. As one provider shared with me recently, there's great comfort in walking into a centering room and seeing people who may look like you, who live in your community and share your lived experiences. The group environment is safe and inclusive. Group members are encouraged to share from their own experiences, cultural beliefs, and values. The result of providing care in this way is a deeper and more meaningful exchange of ideas. Participants enjoy being a part of a community of support and friendship and are collaborative partners with their healthcare team. CHI has scaled the centering framework to more than 600 locations in every type of healthcare setting in the US, transforming care for 70,000 parents and children each year. The robust evidence base demonstrates that centering moms have healthier babies. In over 100 published studies and peer-reviewed articles, centering pregnancy has been proven to lower the risk of preterm birth, close the disparity gap in preterm birth between black and white women, and improve both visit attendance and patient satisfaction. Participants report greater readiness for birth and infant care, higher breastfeeding rates, and greater confidence. The available evidence suggests that centering has a combined effect of stress reduction, education, and patient activation that brings about these impressive results. Thanks, Marina. That was a fabulous overview to, to what Centering is and, and what it looks like for clinicians and families. I, I'm Angie Truesdale, and I am the CEO of Centering Healthcare Institute. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the statewide initiatives to expand and incentivize Centering. Uh, Andrea mentioned that there are nine states where we've accomplished enhanced payment models for centering pregnancy. And what that looks like and what it can look like is either individual uh, Medicaid managed care organizations or commercial insurers or even statewide Medicaid programs coming together to create policies to promote uh, the adoption and, and of the centering model. Um, Obviously, we have a healthcare system that, that really does what it's paid to do. And, and so if, if you're going to take two hours of a clinician's time, um, it certainly helps to compensate them a little bit more to accommodate the changes that have to come at the systems level of a healthcare uh, clinic to uh, transition to group care. And so as Marina mentioned, they're already paid per patient per visit the same way they would for, for individual care. So this is a little bit more on top of that. And uh, we're seeing great success. Uh, in three states, we have a statewide Medicaid uh, program offering for enhanced reimbursement. And that's seen in Montana, South Carolina, and Texas. And those rates uh, range from as low as $7 in Texas, but we're working on that this year, um, to uh, more than $30 in South Carolina. Um, and again, that's on top of the, the routine reimbursement levels for the prenatal care visit. Uh, in Georgia and in New York State, and I'm so glad Melanie's with us today to talk about all the exciting things going on in New York State, um, we have payment pilots going on where uh, the state uh, Department of Health is working with, uh, in many cases, um, well, in both these cases for sure, working with community stakeholders and community-based organizations like many of you to create pilots 
where uh, in target areas enhanced reimbursement is being uh, studied and, and tried and um, to see how it impacts outcomes and adoption of the model. Uh, and then in the other states you see highlighted up there, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, you have uh, at least one Medicaid managed care organization just offering it for, for their beneficiaries and preferred um, healthcare providers. And so all of that activity plus recently passed authorizing legislation uh, in New Jersey that will pave the pathway for them to have enhanced reimbursement means that the states are really starting to see the return on investment um, for centering and community level collaborations, um, savvy state departments of health and, and other government agency uh, teams are, are really what's driving this change much more than I can say that the Centering Healthcare Institute is. These are often grassroots, state capital driven initiatives that make this change, which is incredibly exciting for us to see. What's not on this map is states like Ohio that have invested nearly $10 million over the past many years in uh, not incentivizing through reimbursement, but so supporting individual clinical sites or developing um, county-based infrastructure to, uh, to support the adoption and implementation of the model. And in many, in many cases, sustainability. In California, you see many of the first five organizations um, playing that role. So depending on the states, it's political dynamics, who the stakeholders are, uh, you're seeing a lot of different ways to, to, for states and communities to embrace centering. And why are they doing it? That's the big question. So all of these, the common denominator here is the payers, right? The payers really drive how healthcare is delivered in a community. And, um, and the reimbursement is a key piece of that. So for the payer, the benefits are centering is that it is an evidence-based model. Marina referenced uh, more than 100 published studies that's growing all the time. Um, most of them are in centering pregnancy, which is why we're seeing so much of the reimbursement activity about that, but we have a growing evidence base for centering parenting as well, really focusing on the social, emotional, and developmental opportunities um, for those caregiver and patient dyads. Uh, states and payers look at HEDIS measures um, in terms of how they're performing and, and what the outcome scores are for, for a large set of, of patients. And so um, there are many HEDIS measures identified during the prenatal care episode and um, into the first year of the baby's life that align perfectly with the improvement and outcomes that we see in centering. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but centering saves the system money. Um, for every NICU stay avoided, for every mom that doesn't have a adverse incident during delivery, uh, there are cost savings to the system. And of course we know that the cost in terms of the trajectory of for, for mom and baby is immeasurable. Um, but payers care about that, that bottom line number and um, centering helps with that. Uh, you may be, you don't have to be a policy want to be hearing a lot about value-based purchasing. Uh, there are federal mandates that have gone to the states and all the payers that they need to move from a uh, fee-for-service schema where you, know, you bill for every band-aid provided um, and a volume-driven medical system where you're trying to see as many patients as you can, um, no matter how short or poor quality those visits may be, to one that's focused on outcomes. And, um, and, and that's what they're talking about with value-based purchasing. And so centering uh, aligns well with that. Uh, and it can meet, it can meet the, the current reality of, of a volume-based system as well. Um, but, but really, as our entire healthcare system slowly and painfully shifts over to value-based care and value-based reimbursement, 
um, more and more states are looking to centering to be part of that. And then of course, there's a quadruple aim, which I think many of us in the, in the healthcare universe hold up as our guiding force for how we make decisions and where we should be going. And of course, it starts with patients and outcomes, um, but then also takes into account that we need to lower the cost of care and, uh, and we have a, an increasingly critical issue of provider burnout where, where clinicians and other healthcare providers do not, um, do not want to stay in the field. Uh, and so um, the quadruple aim seeks to solve for that too. And centering aligns very well with all four of those. So it's pretty attractive to payers um, as they're held accountable for, for contributing to better outcomes on all these fronts. Now, South Carolina, we hold up as, as our first real state experiment um, in centering, um, and it's a great one and a favorite one. Uh, a lot of the uh, really wonderful research that's looking at health disparities in centering um, has and continues to come out of a research team in South Carolina. And, uh, and they were really critical in, in creating this fabulous Medicaid enhanced reimbursement scheme. It's really the standard that we're trying to replicate around the country. And so uh, quick timeline of how that happened. The first randomized control trial showing a reduction in preterm birth was centering was published in 2007 and uh, Greenville Health System adopted the model, uh, adopted centering pregnancy shortly thereafter. And the uh, clinician, Amy Finkelsheimer Crockett, uh, published within a couple of years, I think she originally really tried it uh, because she had a lot of provider burnout and poor morale uh, from her clinical team in obstetrics because they were seeing a lot of a lot of patients that had very high social determinants needs and poor birth outcomes. And, and she was just really worried about the moral toll it was taking on the staff because there weren't really any answers, um, any good evidence-based answers for, for changing those outcomes at that time. So that's what she was thinking when she adopted the model. But then she started to notice that it actually was changing the outcomes as well as morale and her staff. Um, and she reported a 47% reduction in preterm birth for her clinic. Uh, she used that data to uh, create a coalition and work directly with stakeholders within the governor's office and the state Medicaid agency to launch uh, a South Carolina birth outcomes initiative and formalize that, that coalition that she had built and really start having uh, the state invest in two ways. One was to uh, create a, uh, an enhanced reimbursement, and that's $30 per patient per visit, plus a kickback bonus uh, for providers. So uh, really rewarding them for investing the time to do the systems change with centering. And then the second piece was the state created uh, an initiative to bring on uh, clinical practices to adopt the model of centering through a, a competitive grants process. And through that competitive grants process, um, little old South Carolina has grown up to almost 30 sites uh, at the end of 2019. Um, and they're still growing and still publishing and still seeing amazing outcomes. And so, I think a lot of states um, look to South Carolina as a great example um, of what this can look like. Um, whether you're in a progressive state government or a conservative state government or whatever the, the politics may be in your state, um, South Carolina shows the savings that can come to the system and what can happen uh, when community-based and, and clinically driven coalitions approach the state to make change. Um, and, and in honor of that, really, uh, Dr. Pa 
Pickles and Myrtle Crockett was awarded the McNulty Prize, which is um, an international prize looking at life-changing interventions for communities. And she was able to, to come out number one in that, that contest in, in 2016 uh, and, uh, and really call a lot of beautiful attention to centering. And in light of this, this experiment that happened in centering, the state has uh, the Medicaid program and the healthcare researchers co-published a paper a couple of years back that showed the, uh, the ROI for the state on this. So uh, again, these are the official state numbers, 36% reduction in preterm birth rate, 44% uh, reduction in low birth weight, 28% reduction in NICU admission, and they are saving nearly $4 million over and above their investment um, to fund the new centering sites and the, uh, the enhanced reimbursement piece. Melanie's going to talk in, in a few minutes about um, the cost to do this from the state perspective, certainly from the, the perspective of first 1,000 days. And I'll, I'll ask you to keep that last slide at the forefront of your mind as why would a state take this on? The reason is, is whatever they're investing now, they're going to get back. And then that's before you factor in the uh, long-term benefit to these families and their ability to thrive and lead productive lives um, through the better outcomes. So I said South Carolina was the, the experiment. Here's what other states are doing. Just a quick snapshot of some exciting things going on in New Jersey. Uh, just in, in what we call a whiplash year. And in that state, we had uh, a couple of community-based state funders uh, enter into conversation with the governor's office in, in New Jersey and reach out to us to help them formulate a statewide strategy that would grow the access to centering in, in three counties across five clinical sites. These were targeted counties based on poor outcomes and at-risk communities uh, to put designated staff on the ground to support and expand centering further. And uh, on the coattails of that, not even part of that effort, the New Jersey legislature um, introduced and um, unanimously passed both through both chambers of the legislature and, and then on, on final passage to send to the governor a law that really sets up the Medicaid mechanism for a South Carolina style enhanced reimbursement. Um, and you know, there's there's the activity in New Jersey continues. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of attention and focus going on to what this ends up looking like. But now they're they're looking at you know how how far can we take this? And are there 50 more sites that could be had in New Jersey? And that's another small state, so um, stay tuned for updates on that. And then, in addition to New Jersey, we're looking at North Carolina. And those of those of you who are here from North Carolina, I do believe that, that the governor and the legislature are going to break the deadlock and certainly deliver you guys some uh, Medicaid transformation this year. Um, but you know, North Carolina has done something really, really fabulous and interesting, and, and Prince for Children's in Initiative has been part of it. Uh, there are kind of two buckets that have merged together in North Carolina, and that's on the education and early childhood side and at the Department of Health. And so earlier last year, North Carolina released its Early Childhood Act Action Plan that outlines 10 goals um, that, you know, impressively uh, really know no boundaries in terms of where the goals live. So it ranges from a healthy birth experience and for mom and baby to quality childcare and then goes on to a school setting. I mean, it, it really goes from everything to um, the healthcare system to uh, family assistance and, and income and childcare through education, which is so ambitious and so right-minded in my opinion 
in terms of if we're going to really make change for our children, we have to not do it in silos. And so I think a lot of Medicaid directors and a lot of state governments are really watching what's happening in North Carolina with its early childhood action plan, which given all of those areas that, it, that all of these lines that it crossed in terms of jurisdictions and state government, um, really uh, it's amazing that it actually lives in the Department of Health. It's understanding that our healthcare system has to be robust and strong and support families in order to have the educational outcomes and the productive workforce that we need to have the communities that we want. And so um, I can't talk enough about how much I love what's going on with the Early Childhood Action Plan in North Carolina, but I'll try not to go down too crazy of a rabbit hole. Um, the, the way that the Early Childhood Action Plan is being implemented and realized in North Carolina is through community-based organizations. Um, and so again, you see a really beautiful state and community partnership with government actively involved, um, but, but coming down to the community and grassroots level to make change. And they are funding all of this with healthcare and Medicaid dollars. They're funding a social determinants of health pilot um, through Medicaid dollars where money will, uh, a referral will start with a clinician and go to a hub on a regional basis and Medicaid dollars will be utilized to refer that patient to community-based services and they will be paid for by Medicaid dollars. So if you need uh, food, transportation, housing, there's an opportunity in North Carolina for Medicaid to support that. Um, so, very, very exciting with the Early Childhood Action Plan. The other lane of what's going on in North Carolina is in Medicaid transformation. So, uh, North Carolina's governor, governor and uh, the Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Mamie Cohen, have really um, laid out a path and, and plan to get to uh, Medicaid managed care in that state. Um, and, and there's some wrangling budget-wise right now on whether or not that's going to include uh, Medicaid expansion in that state. So that if you're hearing things about North Carolina, that's probably what you're hearing, but that's such a tiny piece of what's going on in that state. Um, but as they're looking at Medicaid transformation in that state, they're taking a very healthy look at maternal and child health outcomes. And so there's lots of opportunity given that centering aligns with most, uh, you know, a significant majority of the goals in the Early Childhood Action Plan. And uh, the payers and the Medicaid department that are, are involved in transformation to, met, uh, to Medicaid managed care in the state uh, all point to centering pregnancy and parenting. Um, you can start to see how North Carolina is easily the next state that, that gets lit up on that map. Um, so sometimes you can shape the environment and sometimes to, to drive centering expansion and, uh, and reimbursement incentives in a state and sometimes you can jump on moving trains um, or lots of moving trains as um, we are actively working to do in North Carolina. And so that's a really high level, um, somewhat dizzying snapshot. It's what's happening in the state policy realm. I, I hope, you know, my hope is, is that it, it really uh, gets your wheels turning on what it can look like in your state and in your community, and that uh, you'll reach out to us to collaborate and work with you to make that happen. Thank you, Angie and Marina, for a wonderful presentation. We'll look forward to um, having you return back to answer questions towards the end of the, the webinar. But at this time, I'd like to introduce Melody Baker. Melody is the owner of a small evaluation firm, Q&A Stats, Director of Education at the United Way of Buffalo in Erie County, former U.S. House Congressional Candidate, Chair of the Erie Niagara Birth to A Coalition, and co-chair of Raising New York. New York. Her day-to-day -day responsibilities include leading the research and evaluation 
for New York State's Department of Health's first 1,000 days on Medicaid initiative, fundraising, designing, and implementing programs, advocacy, and providing leadership for a statewide and local early childhood policy agenda. In 2014, she co-founded the first inquiry-based school in Western New York to build on an early learning program she implemented earlier in her career as assistant director for a Head Start. Without further ado, I hand it over to Melody Baker. Sorry about that. I was so excited to get started that I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, fantastic. All right, so I will go ahead and get started. I'm just going to reset this back up. Um, Okay, so thank you again for that uh, introduction. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our Centering Pregnancy Project and how it's being implemented in our PTI worker, Prit Through Children's Initiative. So Raising New York is an organization that brings together state um, stakeholders, uh, civil rights uh, activists, um, organizations that in New York State that basically care about moving um, an agenda forward that improves lives for uh, families with small children. Uh, within that, within our policy agenda, we have four objectives, but the one that is most important considering, uh, considering centering pregnancy is that all families, is objective number one, all families with infants and toddlers have supported access to programs that value strong and positive relationships with families and ensure that parents, infants, and toddlers receive both screening and a comprehensive set of services that promote maternal health and infant and toddler development. We are realizing this through a strategy using our Centering Pregnancy. It was very important for the coalition to really align with the uh, current things that were taking place uh, within New York State. We saw it as the best way to be able to create real change and move the needle. So our organization strategically aligned with New York State's Department of Health to ensure that we were raising awareness about the messaging, um, about what our purpose is to improve lives for small children in New York State, and so that we can help them create some forward progress. Our strategy, as you can see, is to expand access to high quality prenatal and perinatal care, especially for those most at risk of poor outcomes. We have an indicator, and that indicator is access to centering pregnancy increases by 1,500 slots. That's in year three, and 2,500 more slots by 2023 for a total of 4,000 more. Um, our action, we're working with PTI partners, particular children and initiative partners to support the centering pregnancy community pilots and the expansion. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is New York State's first 1,000 days on Medicaid initiative. This is a really exciting partnership because we are working with partners across the state to ensure that uh, these goals are realized. However, specifically what New York State is doing, they put together a 10-point plan that's been rooted in the need for early child, childhood health programs to collaborate with other sectors, acknowledging the overlap of health, education, and social issues in children's lives in children's lives, recognizing that cross-sector implementation holds the greatest promise for maximizing positive impacts on children and their families. So the New York State Medicaid program, um, it's going to provide 30 additional patient, $30 for additional patient, um, patient visits for up to a maximum of $300 for a two-year pilot focused on neighborhoods with the poorest birth outcomes to 2,000 women. So that is the goal of New York State. And what they're doing currently is um, they've already selected pilots where this is going to be implemented. And they're really trying to encourage OB, OBs to participate because we've seen that outcomes, we've seen, um, of course, uh, improvements for uh, uh, women of color as it relates to birth outcomes. So um, the first 1,000 days, New York State will be contracting with the Centering Health Institute to provide staff training and startup support um, and startup support that will be provided. Um, they are working internally to, to uh, get all payer support um, and then externally so that we can see more providers 
having the ability to provide this, this service. Our metrics, um, what we're going to be measuring is an increase in number of providers offering centering pregnancy, a reduction and a reduction in incidence of low birth weight, preterm birth, and length of NICU stays, NICU stays. Um, so this here is the breakdown, the cost scenario um, of what it's going to cost New York State to do this pilot. Our projected number of participating women, as, as mentioned above, is 2,000. Financial support per patient visit, $30 per visit, up to $300 total. Um, our MCO two-year pilot total is $600,000. Centering Healthcare Institute training costs um, three provider workshops with 25 providers at $18,750 each. And additional consulting support on-site assistance is $120,000. The total cost, as you can see there, is $776,250. Um, and then for the state, our cost is $388,125. So this is a, an exciting initiative that we're looking to um, hopefully expand considering how well this works out. Um, we are going to be supporting this initiative with collective impact strategies which we've seen to be extremely um, beneficial. And for those of you who are less familiar with collective impact, basically what that is, is aligning community, um, community support to expand capacity for the OB providers to uh, get the outcomes that they're looking for. Um, we all understand in order to truly create some level of change and to move the needle to improve outcomes, we have to do it together. So what, what organizations, um, one of the things that we're looking at is what organizations can um, provide support for, uh, for OBs and offices to ensure that those targeted objectives are met. I know that we are short on time. So in, the, uh, in, uh, in an effort to make sure that we stay on schedule, I'll stop there and take uh, questions during the question and answer portion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Melody. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Chloe Jordan, who is going to go through the questions that we've been receiving in the um, chat box. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, so the first question we had, um, we have actually two from Maggie Clark. The first question she has is, do you have write-ups available on each state's payment arrangements for centering? Hi, Maggie. And I'm thinking uh, that, okay, I was going to say Marina or, or Angie, yes. Yeah, so we're starting to put together case studies. I know that we have a case study that's either finalized or close to finalized on, uh, on New Jersey. And um, there's certainly lots of documentation, particularly in the publication, uh, the published study that came out from South Carolina on their payment arrangements. Uh, we can connect with you offline if you'd like and we can share what we know. Some states and particularly some individual payers don't tend to publish that, um, but we're always happy to share what, what we know in our tracking. Perfect. And the second question that Maggie has is, are there similar Medicaid financing arrangements for centering parenting as with centering pregnancy? Not yet. Uh, I think a lot of that's tied to the emerging research base. Uh, we had many, many studies um, on the improved outcomes for centering pregnancy before we started to see uh, this momentum build on the payment side for pregnancy. Um, the other uh, opportunity and challenge is that um, considering parenting, our hypothesis is, and anecdotally we're hearing from clinicians, that considering parenting has improved outcomes well beyond what's measured from a healthcare setting. And so, Yes, we're seeing increased and prolonged uh, breastfeeding and um, 
might be seeing lower childhood obesity rates and and, and in, certainly an increase in developmental screening and uh, postpartum depression screening for um, moms and even um, coping for caregivers. Uh, but what we're also looking at a lot of social emotional improvements that are going to be much more of interest to the education setting than it might be to um, a healthcare setting. Unfortunately, that's so siloed that, that can be so confining. And so the enhanced payment and other incentives um, for centering parenting may come from a variety of sources down the pike. What we are seeing and what we do have in place is um, lots of initiatives to um, provide implementation support for uh, new clinical sites to start centering parenting. And so CHI has um, an increasing number of um, what we call implementation awards that we run um, competitive grants process for in-kind supportive services during the first two years, including the training and, uh, and um, the training and consulting and systems change work that happens in the clinics that do the model. And so uh, there are some that are state targeted and lots that are national. And so um, certainly if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, do reach out to us. And we have a question from Michelle Gorlo. Does the Centering Healthcare um, Institute still charge an annual licensing fee? Sorry about that, uh, we were on mute. Um, so we, we do, we do uh, charge an annual licensing fee and um, I can put a link to what all of that covers uh in the chat box um but it's everything from weekly webinars and technical assistance from our uh, practice transformation team to um access to lots of resources and and, and all to support your center site so um we'll post that link uh momentarily for you to see what's included with that Wonderful. And we've had some more questions come up and raised for um, both states where um, currently the work that you provide in those states is happening, but there are some states that are asking, for instance, um, Carol Gross um, asked if you're looking to expand into Colorado and any other states where you're currently not necessarily there. And, and yes, and I want to clarify that those states that were highlighted on the map are just where we have payment incentives. We have 600, more than 600 centering practices across 47 states in the country, including Colorado, where there are some fabulous um, pioneering programs that have been doing centering, um, not only with centering pregnancy and, and parenting, but diabetes, substance abuse, pain management groups, um the whole gamut of, of of centering and that's what we're seeing in a lot of um particularly in federally qualified healthcare centers where you have a lot of subspecialties that are really community driven healthcare system where you'll see um they'll, they'll start with centering pregnancy or parenting and they'll kind of get into their blood and their culture and uh you'll see other patient groups being seen through centering style groups and Francis Fernandez, can a centering pregnancy be like a midwifery birth center? So centering occurs in almost every type of clinical setting. So it could, uh, certainly um, is in midwifery practices within academic medical centers. It's in midwifery based birth centers and non midwifery based birth centers. Marina, you want to add to that? Really, again, it can be in any type of healthcare setting. What makes it centering is that it is the billable visit. So there has 
each group has to be facilitated by um, a practitioner who can bill for that prenatal or pediatric care. That's what might set it apart from other types of groups or other programs. Perfect. And Sandy asked, are there models that include private payer reimbursement? Yeah, so uh, commercial insurance private payer also does uh, reimburse providers uh, exactly as they would individual care. And some of them uh, are, are doing incentives as well. I will say that that's not something we uh, that's not something that we track very closely just because we're very focused on targeting um, growth and incentives in communities where uh, there's poor outcomes, uh, deep health disparities, and, uh, and a lack of commercial insurance options for them. So um, it's definitely reimbursed. There's definitely some incentives, but we don't track those incentives very closely. Wendy asked, is mixed age child care center, birth through three, supported through any state projects included with centering? Mixed age child Supported through any state projects that include centering. Because it is the health care visit, um, I mean, I know that there's some school-based health care clinics that are doing centering, uh, particularly in some Chicago FQHCs, but a child, unless that child care setting would normally host a health care visit, it wouldn't be the appropriate setting for centering. Adriana Leo asked, can you be trained in centered programming if you do not have a medical degree? For example, if you were a co-facilitator with someone who was able to bill insurance. Yes, yes. Marina, you want to talk about co-facilitators? Uh, this is a, a great question, and we have seen across the country people in a variety of different ro roles be the staff facilitator to be um, working with that practitioner and so that role could be anything from a medical assistant or a nurse or someone from behavioral health, a developmental specialist, a patient navigator, a community health worker, uh, could be a doula, could be breastfeeding, it could be tribal elders <laughs> filled that chair in the past in IHS sites. Yeah, we get really excited when we hear about some of the, the different um, roles that are acting as the, the staff facilitator in um, uh, the WIN network, which is in Detroit. Detroit. Um, they, uh, Henry Ford um, has built out this really amazing and thoughtful program using um, community health workers um, and it's, it's, again, just another really impressive way to make that centering group um, feel uh, very safe and inclusive for all of the participants. And coming down to a couple more, we'll answer about three more questions and then we'll close out. Are there any centering programs specifically in tandem with um, MAT, MET, to, for moms and substance use disorders? Any specific evidence on effectiveness, if so? The answer is yes. Uh, I can't list them off the top of my head, and we can certainly search the bibliography, uh, the centering bibliography for any publications um, that call that out. If you want to follow up, with us offline, we can certainly get that for you. But it is happening, um, both for uh, match for general patient populations and for addicted moms. And do centering pregnancy slash pregnancy curricula include an educational portion 
meaning brain science and the key elements of relational health in the early years of life? It's one question first from Katie. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. We are working really closely with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child um, and recognizing the critical importance of relational health and, and building that out a little bit further. Um, I want to emphasize that the curriculum that the Centering Healthcare Institute puts out for uh, facilitators does not include clinical content. Um, what we're providing guidance around is group facilitation and creating a safe and welcoming environment uh, for the clinical care and the interactive um, activities and discussions to take place. That said, we do provide a lot of suggestions and activities for the centering facilitators to engage the group on various topic areas, whether it's uh, pregnancy spacing or inner partner violence um, and other contributing factors that impact whole health. And, um, I think we're looking at brain development a little bit more in centering parenting um, than we have been for centering pregnancy, but it's definitely on the radar, right, Marina? Mm -hmm. Who I was speaking mm -hmm. okay. Gotcha. And um, Marta Bills made a point that she clicked on the link regarding the licensing but did not see the fee itself. Um, yes. So, go ahead. You're very right. Um, so the fee uh, is, is different depending on how large of a site you are, whether you're an FQHC or not. Um, so the setting and um, whether or not you're a centering accredited site. And so that's usually a conversation between uh, our uh, practice transformation team and an individual site to come up with the um, appropriate fee for, for sites. All right, and the last question is, that, is there any researched information about the impact of centering on positive parenting, which I think you were getting to earlier? Mm -hmm. so, so the evidence base for centering parenting um, right now is, is, I believe there's 15 published uh, studies on it, and this um, is growing. We're hearing about um, some interesting research happening. Um, there is not one very specifically um, focused on positive parenting, although one that was um, published last year um, in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine did focus on uh, parental perceptions of, of their experience. Um, and again, something we can provide a link for if someone's interested. I will put out there that we um, would love for there to be some additional research around this, uh, around the centering parenting model. We do have a uh, three-year randomized control trial that's underway that's being led by Dr. Renee Boynton-Jarrett at Boston Medical Center. Um, but if there are other researchers, I saw a question come through on the chat about uh, research related to ACEs and toxic stress, uh, we would certainly uh, welcome discussions with you um, if there are researchers on the call. And last question from Christy. I believe this is for Melody. How often have centering programs overlapped with Reach Out and Read? But for everyone, it's, it's I don't well. know the exact. Oh, it's for Melody? Well, it can be for everyone. Just. Oh, Melody, feel free yeah. to jump in. Hi, that's a great question. So that is exactly one of the things that we were looking at um, considering collective impact is how can we use some of those other pilots? Um, because as you may or may not know, Reach Out and Read is one of the five uh, fund pilots through New York State Department of Health. Um, but yes, ideally, um, that's the goal. So, so far, it has not um, been implemented in that way. But we are looking to ensure that um, 
we are taking a cross-sector approach to ensure that all resources that are available, all um, other strategies can be used by those particular communities. So uh, an example of that would be um, centering pregnancy, collaborating with Reach Out and Read, and at the very end of the program, perhaps that family would receive a book. And um, as they continue to transition, they would uh, participate very closely with those pediatricians because one of the things that we found in New York State is that uh, the pediatricians and the OBs don't necessarily work together. They have a history of being siloed. So uh, that was an excellent question, but ideally we'd love to see all of the pilots working together. Centering pregnancy, reach out and read, our home visiting strategy, peer navigation, and um, our data integration piece. So, that is the goal. Thank you for your question. Hopefully that answered it. Perfect. Well, we would like to thank everyone for all of those very insightful questions and to our wonderful presenters, Angie and Marina and Melody. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar. Um, and we thank all of you for participating and giving us an hour of your day. Um, I want to remind you all to please complete the online survey. We appreciate your feedback and use it to help design our future webinars. Thanks again, and everybody have a wonderful day.